Thank you for joining us for this Texas Tribune event, a conversation between Ruth Simmons and Tribune Editor-in-Chief Sewell Chan about Simmons' new memoir, Up Home, One Girl's Journey, about growing up in Texas during the 40s and 50s. This is the first in a series of conversations with Texas-based authors and authors of works focused on issues that matter to Texans. Our major sponsors for this program are Educate Texas, J.P. Morgan Chase, Texas State Technical College, and Raise Your Hand Texas. Though corporate sponsors and donors underwrite the event, they play no role in determining the content, speakers, or line of questioning. The Texas Tribune is a nonprofit news organization and we rely on support from folks like you. If you value our events and our journalism, join us as a member at texastribune.org slash donate. This conversation was recorded on August 31st, 2023, prior to the publication of Up Home. Here's Sewell Chan and Ruth Simmons. Hello, everyone. I'm Sewell Chan, Editor-in-Chief at the Texas Tribune. I feel so privileged, honored, and humbled to be here today in the presence, <clears throat> excuse me, in the presence of Ruth J. Simmons. Dr. Simmons served as president of Prairie View A&M University from 2017 until earlier this year, 2023. She was previously the president and professor of comparative literature and Africana studies at Brown University from 2001 to 2012. Under her leadership, Brown made significant strides in improving its standing as one of the world's finest research universities. Dr. Simmons completed her PhD in 1973 in Romance Languages and Literatures at Harvard, and then served in various faculty and administrative roles at the University of Southern California, Princeton, and Spelman College before her appointment in 1999 as the president of Smith College, the largest women's college in the United States. She launched a number of important academic initiatives at Smith, including an engineering program, the first at an American women's college. We're here today to discuss Dr. Simmons' new memoir, Up Home, One Girl's Journey, which is being published by Random House. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Dr. Simmons, this memoir is such a rich and moving read. It feels like the product of really a lifetime of reflections. And indeed, you take, you know, in into the book, you know, a whole variety of your professional experiences, but then you're really looking backward and focusing, you know, at your childhood and, and early upbringing. And indeed the book really, you know, goes until you're, you're, you're about to graduate from college. Um, I, I hadn't known what to expect. I hadn't known how much of your academic career would get into. First of all, what, what, what prompted you to focus on those early years? Well, at my age, um, as you might imagine, I'm very much aware that, that uh, the period that I grew up um, uh, in uh, is something that most uh, of my students have no awareness of. Um, they have no awareness of segregation. They have no awareness of Jim Crow. They have no awareness of the kinds of things that took place during that period. And so they have a tendency to look in the current times upon matters of gravity to be sure and think that they cannot be overcome. Uh, and so I wanted to write this for my students so that they would understand the ways in which societies evolve um, even beyond the worst, the most unimaginable um, uh, strictures. Um, and so uh, I started on it when my students kept asking me questions about um, why it is that I am not angry, given what they know of my background. And um, I wanted to make sure that they had at least the means to understand the way in which uh, living out of a life goes through many different stages and many different opportunities to grow. Because um, to me, that's what education is about. It, it, it really is about growth. Um, and so I hope my students enjoy my book. Um, it's a really uplifting book. And as you 
say it talks a lot about adversity, but it also talks about talks about learning from it. And you know, the cliche that when one door closes, another opens is, is something you write about quite a bit. Let's yes. start. Let's start a bit at the beginning. Um, you were born in 1945, immediately after the end of World War II, the youngest of 12 children. Uh, your parents were sharecroppers. And you talk a lot about um, their family's lives and their family stories and how they ended up in East Texas. Tell us about the process for, um, that you uh, undertook to research that family history. Well, one of the wonderful things about having a large, um, uh, close-knit family um, is that um, you are uh, on an everyday basis hearing about this history. And so I grew up understanding from my mother and father what the lives of uh, their parents had been. And so um, many years ago, um, I was very curious about following up on what I had been told as a child. Um, and I went to the area courthouses uh, in Crockett, Texas, and in Leon County to see what records existed of my family. Um, and this included uh, finding the marriage license of my, um, my grandparents, um, uh, who uh, frankly were just out of slavery and trying to find a way to, to, to make a life. Um, and um, I learned how they got married and who officiated um, their marriage. And also about their plan, which was uh, to be official, to be registered, and to be able to purchase property. And I found the documents showing uh, what they had done in order to save money and to buy a, a tract of land in East Texas. And this is so important to me uh, because, you know, you feel uh, when you're impoverished uh, so dispossessed in the present, but to know that your grandparents actually were thoughtful enough to try to acquire land for their successors. Uh, it's an amazingly empowering thing to think about that period and how difficult it must have been for them to do that. Um, and so I slowly acquired uh, more information by talking to my elders asking them specifically about um, what they knew of that period. Um, and then of course, um, Skip Gates did um, a, a study of me for finding my roots and he went back uh, and did the DNA um, research uh, and brought up to uh, me uh, the fact of where my more distant relatives came from and what part of Africa we were from and so forth. So it's been a journey over the years to find out um, this information, but it has been so fantastic, every element of it, to learn about what we have been a part of. Uh, because my journey has been largely about finding out who I am uh, and why I am who I am. So every element of that I prize. Um, how much growing up in the shadow of Jim Crow was the experience, um, you know, of, I mean, several of your, I believe several or most of your great grandparents had been enslaved. Is that correct? Yes. Has, has that, was that experience and their experiences, was that part of the family history that was passed down to you when you were a child? Uh, well, they didn't talk so much about the experience of slavery. There was there was a, a, a certain silence around um, certain aspects of that era. So, for example, uh, we were very mindful of the fact that um, we somehow uh, there was a white there was white lineage in our background. But one didn't talk about it because that was not to be spoken of, right? Um, and some of the elements of what um, uh, their uh, parents experienced in slavery um, were clearly not to be talked about. And so they didn't share that with us. But um, because of the um, 
obvious uh, elements of those connections, um, we understood that um, there were painful memories for them that we should not press them about. Uh, there were elements of their background that we should not um, speak to unless they spoke to us about it. So my grandmother, um, if you saw a picture of her, uh, she had um, very long straight braids um, and looked very much like, uh, I would say, um, a Native American. And uh, her mother um, was a slave, but her father was obviously white. In fact, um, there was a connection between her name and a prominent family in the hometown where we grew up. Um, and so uh, we knew that there were white Beasleys and we knew that my grandmother's name was Beasley and that she was very fair. And so we just drew conclusions, uh, obvious conclusions from what we saw, from what we observed. And of course, informally, we talked about it, of course, without confronting uh, her about it. So it was a very um, it was a very strange way to exist because that silence permeated life at that time because uh, one couldn't talk about certain things. And uh, of course, here we are again today with policymakers instituting the same kind of practice, which is there are some things that must not be spoken of, uh, and there are some things we should not be reading. Uh, there's something we should not seek to know. So I've been through that period before, and I understand the effect that it can have on what you understand about yourself. Well, that's such a powerful story. And I'm struck in the book, that detail that the two Beasleys, one was spelled with an S and one with a Z. And yes. everyone knows, everyone knows, uh, everyone knew obviously what what the truth was, but that that changing of one letter as if somehow that could, you know, hide or conceal, you know, a, a truth that was in plain sight. And you yes. also talk about, of course, that that even in an era of hypersegregation, there's also a, you know a great deal of proximity uh, between people whose families must have interacted both during the uh, the slavery era and afterward. Dr. Simmons, let's talk a little bit about your parents. Um, this is a very, very um, moving and powerfully and closely observed book. And you really, you don't pull any punches. You're, you're hard on yourself at times. And you're also very, very honest and unflinching in your characterization of your parents. And in particular, you write about um, your father who, who was really heavily shaped by the racism of his era uh, and about your mother who was heavily shaped by, among other things, her relationship with your father. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the journey you took in exploring their paths and painting them and drawing them as such rich characters? Well, you know, of course, when one writes a memoir, the first difficulty to confront um, is that you must tell the truth. Um, or at least the truth as we see it. And um, I was lucky enough growing up to have two parents for the entirety of my child, uh, my child, most of my childhood. My mother died when I was uh, 15. Um, but um, this had an incredible uh, impact on me because whatever they were, they were there uh, for me and for my uh, siblings. Um, every step of the way. And the point that I make frequently is that in that era, one couldn't be sure when you had a child that they would even live to adulthood. Uh, but my parents wanted to make sure that we did. And they did everything possible to help that um, along, including giving us strict instructions about how we were to deal with segregation and with racism. Certain, certain things we couldn't say, certain places we dared not go, certain behavior we could not exhibit uh, because uh, one took a risk in stepping outside of certain boundaries in that era. And so they were very careful to be strict with us. I mean, truly strict with us in terms of 
being watchful and making sure that we didn't do certain things. My mother, it was quite hard for me to write about my mother because obviously I idolized her. Um, uh, she um, had a difficult life, um, uh, not unlike many women of her time, because she had the burden of bearing and raising children in very difficult circumstances. But she had the burden, too, of being a field hand, going to the field and helping to bring in uh, crops um, as a sharecropper. Um, and she had no resources to speak of um, to do all that she needed to do. And in spite of her heroic um, behavior, uh, I feel that my father, being of his time, was um, disrespectful of her as a person in that uh, he uh, added to her burden by um, making her uh, wait on him hand and foot, do his bidding uh, by withholding from her many of the basics that um, people might have uh, in, in life, uh, being himself incredibly selfish and, um, and holding things for himself uh, and, and not for her, uh, uh, not allowing her to have a voice. I can't remember my mother ever disagreeing with my father. Um, that would have been uh, very dangerous to do in my house, in my household. So this is prior to the women's movement, but, um, but to me, uh, my mother is as extraordinary and as valiant as, as any woman in the post um, women's movement era uh, because of what she had to bear and how she bore it. And in spite of that, she managed to teach her children the most incredible values. She had no respect, but she taught us to respect everyone. Uh, she had no resources but she taught us to give as generously as we could of anything we had to others who might need it. Uh, it's extraordinary to me that she was able to uh, develop that kind of generosity when people were so ungenerous toward her. And so, um, and so I, I, I try to be honest about the aspects of this that I saw um, but, and I love my father dearly, but I cannot approve of the way he lived his life. Uh, I cannot approve of the way that he treated his, my mother and his children. Um, and after my mother died, um, I, I was able to reconcile myself with this uh, when I became really an adult. Um, and I understood that he was the man he was. And I could not, I did not have the power to change that history. I only had the power to be who I was, having learned from what I saw in him. And so that's how I tried to reconcile myself to it. Now, you grew up, of course, um, at, in your childhood, you really lived in a very kind of, you know, subsistence agriculture kind of setting in yes. um, farms and areas in and around Grapeland in East Texas. Now, you moved with your family to Houston. Uh, I believe it was in the 1950s, correct? Yes. And um, obviously, this was a time not only nationally of the Great Migration, but also smaller migrations, including many migrations yes. of African-American families from the countryside or from farms uh, to the city. Um, your, you know, evocation of kind of mid-century Houston is, is really fascinating. And you went from basically being able to play out kind of in open fields to frankly, you know, substandard and very overcrowded housing. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that move to Houston, why it occurred, and, you know, what impact it had on you? I suppose our move um, was typical of families of that era, and that is older children uh, who were able to relocate and find jobs in urban areas often made it possible for their families, um, their, their parents and the rest of the family to join them in those urban areas. And that's precisely what happened to us. My oldest uh, siblings um, uh, moved to Houston. 
and they started saving money um, to uh, and setting up um, uh, housing that would allow us to move to Houston. And and that was really uh, extraordinary uh, because I, I I do know that had that not happened, uh, my life would have been very different today because in the rural area uh, where cotton was king uh, and crops had to be picked, um, uh, the older children didn't really get to go to school. Um, it was much more important for uh, for that field work to be done. Um, and so by moving to Houston, uh, we got to, the younger ones got to go to school every day. It was, it was extraordinary to us that we had that blessing that we could go to school every day. Um, and um, our, our living conditions uh, were not necessarily um, ideal, but at the same time, um, the being in Houston offered things like uh, books, um, a community center, uh, the opportunity to to uh, um, be involved in sports, um, and so so there's no question that this was a tremendous upgrade for us um, as a family. Um, it wasn't so much for my mother because she uh, she changed from doing field work to being a maid. Um, uh, and my father became uh, a janitor. Uh, but still, uh, overall, for the family, uh, it turned out to be a much better life um, than what we had in East Texas. You talked about your dad's work as a janitor and how he he was able to hold that job very successfully for decades. But, you know, yes. you're very honest about the fact that, you know, when around whites, he could often be very um, or come across as very friendly and reliable, but also somewhat servile. Whereas at home, of course, his his influence on you and your mom, you know, was yeah. quite different. You know, how was is that really kind of the directly a product of the racism that he experienced? Well, I mean, uh, as I as I say in my book, I think I think he experienced the harshest uh, treatment and the most severe deprivation um, in his life. And he turned that um, on, um, on us, uh, basically, uh, because while he was obsequious uh, in the workplace, uh, saying, um, yes, sir, and doing um, uh, the bidding of whites and smiling constantly at them, uh, he, he was a bit of a tyrant uh, at home. And so, yes, I, I think that's the effect that um, those circumstances had on, on him. He didn't really know how to be a caring um, human being uh, who was generous um, in the way that he dealt with, uh, with his children. He, he, he simply didn't know that that was something that was important. Um, uh, and, but he knew uh, that in order for him to survive, uh, as a black man in that era, he knew that he had to he had to submit himself to these kinds of behaviors around whites, and he did. You know, your book is is really written in such a, an accessible and and vivid style. You never use the word intersectionality, but of course, I was thinking about the intersection of race and gender and class and status, um, you know, of, of all the people in your family, but especially your mom. Um, your mother passed away, as you mentioned, at eight, when you were 15 years old, you're the youngest, and uh, she had some really untreated health conditions that had um, been not attentively uh, um, looked at or even recognized for quite a while. Uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, her passing as really the central act of your childhood and, and the effect that it had upon you at the time. Well, this is, of course, um, still difficult for me to talk about. Um, but um, I was not as aware as some in the family that she was suffering from uh, kidney uh, disease. Uh, and that she had been given a pretty um, bad prognosis. Um, and and so I was, again, blithely unaware of this. Even, um, even, before, uh, even before you were born, she had been given this prognosis. Yes, yes. 
And so when one day she couldn't get out of bed, um, it, you know, I I didn't know what to to make of it. I didn't see it as being as as serious as perhaps some did. Um, but um, frankly, uh, things um, eroded very quickly. Uh, from the time that I learned she was uh, grievously ill until the moment she died was uh, brief. It it might have been a month, um, and so. To me, that speaks to how hard it must have been for her, given her health, to continue to do her work every day and to take care of us without our knowing how ill she actually was. I, it, it, it's mind blowing to me. Um, and so uh, she was um, taken to the hospital in the neighborhood. Um, and we had uh, um, a few weeks to visit her in the hospital, uh, but then she she passed, and um, and this was in the summer before my junior year. It was it was actually uh, right before my my sixteenth birthday, and so uh, I I came, and I have to say I absolutely came undone um, when that happened uh, because first the surprise of it. Um, you know, you think you'll always have your parents. And I certainly, uh, my mother was such a fixture in my life. I thought she'd always be there. And then at 15, to know that she was gone and she would not be coming back. I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with that. And 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 at the time, that kind of um, situation is not, was not something that was talked about. It wasn't something that was dealt with. Today, if I had a student who lost a parent, I'd be trying to get them into therapy right away. Grief, grief, um, grief, counsel, grief counseling. You bet. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Even I'd a vocabulary. Be I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be open to talking to them uh, and so forth, but nobody would talk to me about my mother. Uh, they, my, well, my sisters and brothers couldn't because they were grief stricken and um, and on the edge, probably as much as I was. So I, I felt that I was quite alone in coping with her death. Um, and I did um, the most, you know, that I could do in order to survive that period. Um, and that meant, um, you know, plunging more deeply into my idiosyncrasies, um, my, my reading, um, and my um affinity for uh for uh acting and so forth uh and that um took me through this high high school years but but I was suffering all the way through high school for sure and I, I write in the book about my um graduation day when um I was sitting in the auditorium and I started crying uncontrollably uh, uncontrollably and that my crying spread to the students and then to the teachers. And pretty soon we're all crying at commencement without people knowing why I was even crying. But I was crying because that was the first time, really, that I was showing my full measure of grief on the loss of my mother. It was very difficult. The death of your mother is is really kind of the narrative climax of this powerful memoir, um, and um, and it happens at a time in your life when when you're really plunged into the life of reading and ideas and language and scholarship that would of course characterize your remarkable academic career. Um, you talk a lot about Phyllis Wheatley High School uh, in the Fifth Ward and its role, and I just wanted to ask if you could reflect on that for a moment because the culture of achievement there. Uh, yes, in the era of segregation, but with teachers and educators who seemed very demanding and to have had high, very high expectations um, of the students and, and really the ambition of, of many of these students, many of whom went on to very distinguished careers in all sorts of fields, including law and, uh, and politics and the professions. Tell us a little bit about that milieu of Phyllis Wheatley uh, uh, in, the, in the late 50s and early 60s. Well, at that time, it was very much the case 
that in our neighborhoods, segregated still, adults felt empowered to act with regard to any child. Um, and so um, the fact that I had parents um, didn't make any difference to them. Um, if they saw something in me, if they saw me doing something, um, they would feel um, uh, compelled to assist or to act or to do something. That That's the environment of those communities. And it was the environment certainly of Wheatley. And what rescued me in a sense what, after my mother died is that there came into my life Wheatley teachers who really took me in hand. Um, and they parented me um, and they um, chided me and they pushed me. And I didn't have any idea that college was in the future for me. Um, it was teachers who put that into my head. They did more than put it into my head, actually. They insisted that that was something that I should do. Um, they took me to uh, events, cultural events, uh, to expand on uh, what I knew. Um, they let me into their lives so I could see their families' lives and, and what that was like. So I feel that what Wheatley did for me and so many others is to offer a, an entire, a completely uh, full embrace of who we were and what we could do and what the future might hold for us. And, and I do point out frequently that the value, the greatest value teachers gave at that time um, is that as, as young people, we had no hope of what the future could bring. Why would we? Uh, we were living in a segregated world. We were told that we couldn't go to certain establishments. Um, we were told that there was a ceiling for us. So what could we expect? Very little. And yet these teachers had a vision that things might change one day. And so they insisted that we work not on the basis of what we saw in front of us, but on the basis of what they envisioned for us in the future. Honestly, I don't know how they did that, but they did. And that belief in you helped propel you on to Dillard University and then a junior year at Wellesley College uh, and then an extraordinary, extraordinary odyssey of travel to Mexico and to France, uh, yes. uh, and which is kind of what, what takes you through the conclusion of the book. Um, how did that love of language come about, that love of acting and then language and then really your ability to kind of absorb Spanish and then French and I don't know what other languages. Um, where did that facility come from? Well, um, if you imagine me as a young person in that era, um, you, should, you should imagine me as a person who felt wholly powerless in the face of all the things that I saw. And I discovered that words were very powerful. That expression was very powerful. Yes, I was silenced in terms of what I could say um, publicly, if you will. But uh, I could own words in a way that I couldn't. I couldn't have books. I couldn't have writing utensils, but but by picking up a book and by reading, uh, I could acquire words and, and they were free. So I was imbued with the notion that words um, were incredibly powerful. And I, I learned to love them from the, from the youngest age. Um, and as I deepened my knowledge of uh, language, and began to read about other cultures, I discovered something else. That the reality I was living was not the sole reality. That there were people elsewhere who held different views and who lived a different life. 
And I started to understand that the unique circumstances of our country and our state were the consequence of historical developments that simply ended up the way they were. But that was not immutable. And that was the most important thing to me. I could see that that was not written in the heavens. Nothing that was it, it, Yes. It wasn't foreordained. It, it wasn't absolutely. It was not it was not predestined. It was the result of human and social and political uh uh constructions and institutions exactly. and exactly. and violence. Imagine Dr. how powerful a thought that is for a young person feeling wholly powerless. So so I took off to um go to Mexico to live with a Mexican family and to uh, see that culture from inside out and I just I just knew that my life had to be about learning about other people because that's what I was forbidden to do as a child and that's what I defined for myself uh, and I thought languages would be the perfect uh, vehicle for that now you're a little hard on yourself in the book you say that as a teenager you were pretentious no <laughs> Everybody would agree. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when you, when seriously, when you, when you went off to Wellesley, you know, no one, as I understand it, no one in your family had ever gone that far away from Texas. Oh, goodness. Um, no. Yeah. And, and so even going to New England was a big journey, much less, you know, eventually Mexico and France and the career that you built. Um, you know, in this age of widespread air travel, but also widespread, frankly, YouTube, right? Um, in a way, we, you know, even people who live in isolated areas or people who are disadvantaged, of whom there are so many tens of millions, um, do have a glimpse now of how other people live, if only because of the pervasiveness of kind of mass media. Do you think, uh, what impact do you think that has had on, on people growing up today, including people growing up in challenged or disadvantaged environments? I wish I could say that uh, it provided a solution, but, but here's the problem. Um, even with all of these uh, media, uh, we still make choices, okay? So in, in my time, um, uh, it was important to live in segregated enclaves of thought, um, and people um, did. Uh, today, if I talk to my students about what they are doing on, um, you know, on the internet, they're doing the same thing. They're seeking areas that are uh, exactly as they are as opposed to reaching across to something radically different to see how they can learn from it. And so I think it is not as much a solution as I would have hoped because we still have the same enclaves of thought and bias. Uh, and we can see that um, from people's actions. Uh, what they elect to do, um, the uh, the speech that we hear emanating from people that is uh, filled with um, narrowness and uh, and and hatred and so forth. So people are seeking out um, what ratifies who they are uh, already. That's exactly what um, the segregationists were doing uh, when I was growing up. So we have to find a way to persuade people of the uh, extraordinary benefits of difference, uh, different points of view, uh, different areas, um, going to different parts of the world, respecting different people, and so forth. And we are well um, uh, on the road to that, but I would say we're not anywhere near um, the uh, end of it. Yeah, that's so profound. I, I'm, I'm remind, you know, I've always believed that curiosity and empathy are at the heart of the journalistic craft. Of course, there are values that apply to every field, certainly scholarship as well, and there are values that are in too short supply. So, Dr. Simmons, as we start to wrap up, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, education today. Um, as you alluded to earlier, there are um, folks in power who would prefer that we not understand fully and deeply the history of enslavement, reconstruction, Jim Crow in America, or that, or, or more accurately, that I think some people would love a narrative of heroic and inspiring African-Americans, uh, which they're comfortable with. 
but perhaps less attention to, for example, the role that slavery played in building modern American capitalism um, and in building, in building European nation states, et cetera. And so, you know, how do, <clears throat> how, how do, how should we respond, you know, in the face of that effort to kind of, you know, reduce historical understanding? We have to remember it was really only in the last half century that we have developed a modern understanding of, you know, the falseness of the lost cause mythology, the, the complexities of reconstruction as a real effort, you know, to build a biracial, multiracial democracy. And, and, you know, it feels like every time we make a step forward in scholarship or understanding, perhaps we take a step backward in terms of how much people in power would like us to understand. Well, it, it is to some degree um, disheartening uh, to see so much of um, what we have lived through and we thought overcome um, return. That, that There's no question about that. Nonetheless, um, because we have seen it before, we know that it, it does not have to endure. Thank God for that. Um, uh, this is why I am so happy that um, we have journalism and universities um, able to protect the right of people to have information that is vital to their understanding of um, who we are uh, as a people and who we have been in the past. Um, we know that that is vital to what we can achieve ultimately um, if we want to have a uh, an ever evolving society uh, we have to be aware of what has transpired before um, and we have to be open to an analysis of it that gets beyond what we would most like to hear um, and so i think um, universities have an obligation to fight efforts that are underway um, to um, uh, to shape uh, history uh, in uh, the image of those who wish to have it uh, be um, uh, told to their advantage. Um, universities have to stand up to that. Uh, and if they don't stand up to that, we will see a much more rapid descent, it seems to me. Um, journalism has an obligation to be independent enough to stand up to that um, because um, the general public cannot know uh, really how false these narratives are unless someone is uh, trying to help them see it. And I hope we'll continue to do that. Great. Dr. Simmons, um, uh, in closing, tell us a little bit about your decision to return to Texas, you know, after such a distinguished <laughs> career. You've lived all over the country and indeed all over the world. Much of your career, of course, was in, spent in New England. And yet you chose to come back home in 2017. And um, did that homecoming kind of allow you to write this book? And, and why did it happen in the first place? Well, um, how, do I, how do I describe, um, you know, the feeling of, of going home? The, the the impetus for that. Uh, one way to describe it is that I had a rich uh, childhood surrounded by people who cared for me um, and who helped me um, understand who I could be in the world. Okay. Um, I owed something to the place I came from because it enabled um, a life that I would not have traded for anything. Um, and so I came home because, one, I wanted to be around the people that I uh, grew up with and that I love. I wanted to be um, uh, able to reflect on uh, the experiences that I had. Uh, I wanted to serve institutions that helped me. Um, so one of the first things that I did when I came back is really to try to get involved with, uh, for example, my community center uh, and with uh, efforts to help children, um, because I believe that if we can just focus on our obligation uh, to children, um, that we will be uh, much rewarded uh, in this country. Um, and so, uh, so 
I am home and um, and it means the world to me to be here. Um, you know, I had to learn how to love my country. That That was something that people didn't teach me when I was young. How do I love a place that is so unfair to me? Okay, or my students have a way of asking it. And they say, Ruth, why aren't you angry? Well, um, I'm not angry uh, about um, my past because it's given me a very rich life. Um, and uh, as I say, I have learned so much as a consequence of the fact that I was denied so much at the beginning. Um, and so I, I really do believe that um, I learned to love Texas um, because I grew up and because I came to understand that the people of my childhood uh, and the people who are purveyors of hatred and purveyors of uh, bias uh, don't have to be the story of Texas. They don't have to be. They are only the story of Texas if we permit it. So I'm back in Texas because I want to be one of the ones working to make sure that that doesn't become the defining um, the defining uh, reality for the state that gave me so much. That's really moving. And on that note, I want to conclude by thanking you, first of all, for this rich conversation and thanking you for giving us the gift of this book. Up Home, One Girl's Journey is really one of the most moving, affecting, unflinchingly honest memoirs I've read in a long time. And I think it's a, classic, it's a classic American story in many ways. And it's also a uniquely Texan story and a, and a uniquely Southern story in many ways. And it's just such a rich book. And I intend to recommend it and give it to many young people in my life because I think it is so inspiring um, and important. So thank you, Dr. Simmons. No, oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I want to remind uh, our Texas Tribune audience that Dr. Simmons will appear at our Texas Tribune Festival, which is September 21st to 23rd, 2023 in downtown Austin. Dr. Simmons will be speak on, an, on a panel discussion about higher education, uh, race, uh, and opportunity uh, in the wake of the recent Supreme Court decision on affirmative action. And that discussion is on Saturday, September 23rd at 2 p.m. So please come to our Texas Tribune Festival where you'll be able to meet Dr. Ruth J. Simmons person. Thank you. Thank you.